How much love is too much love? How much is too much to give to God? Those are questions that Jesus answers in today's gospel. And I hope for us in our hearts. Little background. We have here a setup, a political trap. Not that we're not familiar with those in our times, the same divisions have existed throughout the course of history, goes right back to Genesis, the temptation in the Garden of Eden. God, who is generous and gives everything, and the demon, who is stingy and jealous and holds all things to himself. Those two forces, call, call it good and evil, call it the world, the flesh and the devil versus God, they're divisive. They divide human hearts. They divide families. They divide nations. And yes, they can even divide the people of God. Jesus, by the way, he confronts both the evil, but by bringing the good and the generous and the holy into its presence transforms it and turns every sin into an occasion of grace. All of us have received many occasions of grace during these past 48 hours. And I have no doubt that many hearts have been transformed. And that even as we have celebrated the mystery the body and blood of Christ, transubstantiated at every Mass, we've come to recognize that that transubstantiation, that transformation, is not limited to what happens at one time and one place, but goes on in our hearts and in our world through the belief and the love and the presence of everyone who is willing to become what we consume. You know, they say you are what you eat, right? And if in fact we believe that we receive the real precious body and blood of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, then we know that that eternal food transforms us and makes us into what we consume. I'm a little afraid that I'm the closer, you know, and I'm the one that has to sort of bring things to an end. And I'm a little afraid that somehow or other, because when we think of closing something, we sometimes think of maybe the end of a game. You know, like at the end of a ball game, right? We expect the closer to sort of make sure to wrap it up and send everyone home. Is that really what we're doing right here? Are we just ending a nice game? Or are we celebrating a game changer? I mentioned at the beginning, Jesus changes lives. Anyone who comes into Jesus' presence is somehow transformed by that. And if we bear the presence of Christ, then yes, my brothers and sisters, we will change the world. Because God wants to save the world through us. Jesus is the Savior, the only Savior, but he has chosen us, clay vessels, mortal human beings, sinners though we may be. At the beginning of every Mass, we always pause for a few moments to recall our sins, to remember our brokenness, to remember the things that are not right, and to ask for healing, and to ask for forgiveness. But at the same time, we recognize that if we receive that gift, if we receive that blessing, and are sent into the world, remember the last words of the old Latin Mass, ite missa est, go the Mass is. It continues wherever we go, wherever we are present. Remember the nun might have told you in school that you are a tabernacle of the Holy Spirit? Is a tabernacle just a little box? 
that we put Jesus back into and then go home and go back to being what we were before? Or is a tabernacle something that each and every one of us possesses in our hearts, transformed by grace? Yes, on the road, we still recognize that we are sinners, that we are broken, but we're more than our past. I'm afraid that at times when the Lord very generously calls a man or a woman to consider a vocation to the priesthood or the diaconate or to the religious life, that two things often happen. First of all, they're discouraged by those around them. How would God choose somebody like you? But maybe sometimes discouraged by their own past. If that were the case, we would have no saints. If that were the case, St. Augustine would still have been a sexual addict, to put it bluntly. If that were the case, Peter would have hung himself just like Judas did. And I can think of so many other saints too. St. Teresa of Avila, who loved to dress up and enjoy the fine things of life. And remember that story of Teresa's life on the way to Seville. She's knocked off her horse. Not different from another guy that was knocked off his horse, number St. Paul. And she lands in a ditch, she lands in a mud puddle, and she shakes her fist at heaven and says, if this is the way you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few of them. But God changes lives. He gives the grace to do what is impossible. Anybody who is married knows that so many of the hopes and dreams that happen on the day of the wedding and how challenged they become over the years with all of the challenges of in-laws and health and sometimes economic challenges and so many challenges to just being a faithful, good husband or wife. Without God's grace, without the transforming power of grace, all of that would be impossible, but God makes all things possible. Yes, in today's readings today, we see that division, as I mentioned, and the background to that is, of course, they're trying to kill Jesus. We had a prelude to that in the Gospel of Mark. We hear the Herodians are on the scene again. The Herodians were, as you would imagine from that term, very sensual, very involved in the political scene, uh, psychophants, people trying to please uh, Herod and his court, trying to make good. Uh, and uh, the Pharisees are the professional religionists, the ones who knew the law, the men who should have been examples, but instead they ally themselves with the Herodians, and they're even afraid, and Jesus calls out their hypocrisy, they won't come up and show up in front of Jesus because they're becoming increasingly jealous of him because of the miracles he's performing and the lives that are being changed that they have no control over. See, they see it as rivalry. They see that if somebody becomes a follower of Jesus, that somehow or other they're going to lose control. Their view of religion is that it's just another form of control, another way of intimidating people, and all of the things that come with that, domination and power which we see is a theme that runs through all organizations, touched by sin, touched by the temptation of Satan to draw attention to itself. Even us within the church at times can be guilty of the sin of navel-gazing. And we all know the church is at its best when it's on the road. We talk about bringing people into the church, and yes, we should. As we would say in Brooklyn, Fanny's in the pew, you know. But our prime role is to go out into the world and to spread the good news. Don't just keep the faith, spread it. And that's our commission today as well. Well, the Pharisees want none of that. They want to pull everybody in. So they send these lackeys out, these delegates of theirs. They wouldn't show up right away. They thought they could fool Jesus because most of the time the Pharisees were parading around in their liturgical vestments, trying to impress the people with their power. 
And so they send these delegates. But Jesus knows their game. And of course, he calls it. And they ask whether or not it's legal to pay the temple tax. And he says, well, let me see what coins you have in their pocket. Well, of course, they bring the coin out, which proves to them that they're already negotiating with mammon. They're already compromised because they have the money in their pocket. Remember that good Jews did not want to use Roman currency because it had the image of the emperor on it, which was an idolatrous figure. And of course, they're trying to tempt Jesus to say, you know, to, to put, pit himself against the emperor. But he calls their game and says, no, well, you already are playing the game too. But no, give him what he deserves. Jesus isn't telling us that we should remove ourselves from the world of business or of politics or our everyday world. But he's asking another question. Yes, while we do what is just and right in this world, with the things of this world, no division there, but what's our relationship with God? And how generous will we be in responding to the God who is so generous as to give us everything? And we may say we're not ready for that just yet. And St. Augustine said that at one time, O oh Lord, please make me holy. Only not yet. Are we ready for holiness? Are we ready for the next step? Yes, we've been fed. Yes, we've been filled here. But is this the last stop? Is this the end of the game? Or will this be a game changer? I know that there already have been lives that have been profoundly changed during our 24, 48 hours here. And I thank God for it. The confessions, the tears, that I've seen that have been shed. The reflection, the forgiveness, the letting go of old grudges and old fears, and how transformative they've been. You know why? Because we need to do that if we're going to enjoy heaven. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, heaven is often compared to a banquet, right? Because Jesus, God wants everybody to be a part of that heavenly banquet. God wants everybody to stand a chance to get into heaven, right? It means each and every one of us, seriously, even everybody sitting in the back of the church or the back of any church, you know, I even notice a lot of times in a Catholic church, most of the people sit in the back, you know. I wonder why that is. Well, maybe they have to get back into the parking lot. Maybe they have a, to get back home. But every one of us is called to be a saint, every one of us, without exception, I remember in grammar school, one of the sisters said, you know, Jesus would have died for you if you were the only person in the world. Imagine if everybody believed that, including those who are not with us today, who may have felt they weren't holy enough or somehow welcome enough to be here. We hear this all the time, people saying they don't feel welcome in the church. Well, I mentioned we need to go through this exercise because if heaven is a banquet, right, and if you or I are fortunate enough to get there, or at least get to purgatory, I'll be very happy to get to, get to purgatory because I know there's a door on the other side. But if we're fortunate enough to get to heaven as God wants us, what if God and God's infinite sense of humor decides to sit us next to the person who we could least stand in this life. <laughs> but maybe God wants that person to be saved too. That's tough. That's tough, particularly if you are a survivor of some abuse or you've had a terrible relationship with somebody somewhere along the line that has left scars. That's very difficult. And maybe what we just have to do sometimes rather than forgive that person, is just simply to ask God to just transform our hearts and then to leave the rest in God's hands. But if it's not too difficult an exercise, 
Imagine the politician you can't stand, or imagine that grumpy neighbor you can't stand, or that in-law sometimes, it's closer to home, that you just can't imagine as a saint. Imagine that person transformed. What would they look like? It was very difficult, you know, for the early Christian community to accept St. Paul's sudden conversion. St. Paul was yanking people out of synagogues and was persecuting Christians. Remember his story until Jesus suddenly appeared to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know, conversion is possible, sometimes miraculously. And there may be many among us that have stories of conversion in your personal life or know of someone. But that should not surprise us. Jesus is in the process of making saints of sinners. So there is none of us that can say, Lord, because I'm unworthy, I will not take that next step. Of course, we're all unworthy, but he's still calling us, as he called every apostle, as he called every disciple. St. Matthew from behind the tax collector's table, and St. Peter, of course, and not the best fishermen in the world. None of the apostles really were, but he transformed them to be fishers of people. And wow, that's why we're here today, because they spread the good news. So here's my challenge. I know that there are men and women in this Colosseum today that are being called to be priests, deacons, religious I know there are men and women that are being called to the sacrament of marriage. You know, the two of them are not incompatible. They're both ways of loving. It's all about love. Marriage perhaps shows best and most dramatically the depth of love and intimacy. And priesthood religious life shows us the breadth of love that goes out to all God's people. They're not incompatible. A priest is a father too. A father and mother of a family are responsible for bringing others into the world that they may give to the world. Who knows? But my challenge to you is, is God calling you to a vocation? Whatever that may be. And I don't want to exclude those that are called to living the single life. Because as we've heard many, many times today, none of us is disconnected. Even those among us who may be widowed or who may be single for any number of reasons are all connected to this wonderful body of Christ. We all have gifts and talents and a call to share what God has given us for the building up of the body of Christ. Because that's what love is all about. In conclusion, what are we going to do with the real presence of Jesus Christ? Are we going to lock Jesus back in the tabernacle? Are we going to leave him on the altar? Or are we going to embrace him as he wishes to be, and take him into our hearts, into every fiber of our being, and to walk with him in faith, and with one another, with the confidence that he is with us always. And dare I say that as we celebrate the sacramental transubstantiation of the bread and wine that we are about to celebrate into the body and blood of Christ, Dare I suggest that we look forward also to the transformation of our own hearts and souls so that we become truly what we consume. And not only as individuals, happiness is meant to be shared. The joy of the gospel is meant to be proclaimed. 
And it's most visible in the lives of disciples that celebrate, walk, and enjoy one another's presence together in the world. Yet Jesus sent his apostles out, his disciples out two by two, didn't he? Because there is something about that. He did say, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in your midst. We would expect that from a Trinitarian God, you know. God is not alone. God is family, we might say. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, as Catherine of Siena famously said, three persons crazy about each other, pazzo d'amore, she was Italian, crazy in love with each other, revolving around each other for all eternity. This is the dynamism at the heart of all creation. And this blessed trinity, grand enough to create the universe and everything that's in it, is humble enough to dwell in our hearts, humble enough to make our souls tabernacles of his presence. Wow. Too much for us to consume? Yes. But never become discouraged. The most diabolical of all temptations is the temptation to discouragement. Rather, be encouraged, not by our fear of what we're not, but by God's promise of what we can yet become. To allow the Lord to make us truly be his holy people, beginning now. And that our journey to eternity may not be left to the last day of our lives, but may begin at this very moment. Jesus, your name is written on every column of this Colosseum. Your name was born in the hearts of those who shed their blood in your name on these grounds. May your name be etched in our hearts, and wherever we go, may we bring your love.